All right, everybody, it's 9, oh, 10 30 at my clock, 8 30, wherever you are. Uh, it's the 30 minutes on the clock. And so, welcome to the, uh, the first session of the, the conference, really, on gender studies. We have four very interesting and exciting presentations um, for us today. Uh, just a reminder once more that you will have no more than 15 minutes and uh, I will stop you if you didn't stop at the end of the hour. Uh, please turn off your mic um, unless you're presenting as well as your video. So if you're not presenting, uh, turn off your mic as well as your video. And if you have questions, uh, participants as well as uh, presenters, if you have questions, uh, please start typing them on the chat window. I will collect them at the end of the presentation. So with that being said, uh, Abradeep, the time is yours and your clock starts now. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Abradeep Pramukar. I'm a PhD student at the Department of Economics, University of New Mexico. Today, I'm going to present my work titled Household Debt and Female Labor Supply Decisions in India. Professor Kira Villa is the other author of this uh, paper. So the motivation of this work stems from three different strands of literature. The first of which suggests that in most developing countries, major household decisions are major household decisions regarding the human capital acquisition of women are taken by the men in the household or by older household members. Female labor force participation or FLP is one of those decisions and several factors like income, education, perception of violence, childcare costs, poverty affect female labor force participation. The second strand of literature that we are motivated by comprises the fact that an increase in household borrowings leads to an increase in labor supply for both men and women. An increase in household borrowings also leads to an increase in retirement and social security uptake. The third strand of literature that we focus on suggests that in periods of crisis, household borrowings go up. These, period, these crises could be environmental shocks like floods, rainfall, lack of rainfall, uh, earthquakes, and so on. A mix of both environment and non-environment shocks and non-environment shocks like food insecurity, lack of access to healthcare, and so on. So based on these three broad categories of literature, the objective of our work is to examine improvements in female labor force participation due to increases in household debt in rural India. So the null hypothesis is to find no statistically significant impact of household debt, and the alternate hypothesis is to find a positive and statistically significant impact. And to examine this relationship, we use two different methodologies, where in the first case, we uh, have a baseline strategy where we do an OMS. And in the second stage, we do an instrumental variable strategy and uh, where we address the endogeneity in household debt by the incidences of epidemics in the village in the last seven years. The data for this work come from the India Human Development Surveys covering uh, 42,000 households, more than 100,000 individuals in 1,500 villages, and 971 urban neighborhoods. But in this work, we only focus on the villages that we have. The IHTS present a detailed set of individual and household level information on factors like debt, consumption, income, employment, gender, uh, government subsidies, schooling, family structure, and so on. So this is the summary set of the variables that we are using. As you can see, employment status of women is our, is our outcome, and 30% of our sample is employed. We have log of household debt. The mean of household debt is around 16,500 Indian rupees. We have epidemics in the village in the last seven years, and 15% of our sample has been affected by epidemics in the village. We also have environmental shocks in the village in the last seven years. Apart from that, we have information on log of household income, male employment in the household, household size, household membership in different groups like religion groups, 
women's development women's groups development groups and we also include in the regression models indexes on institutional confidence index on media exposure and index on crime and conflict so in this slide i will explain how i created these three indexes so for each of these three broad categories of variables that i have the ihts asks different questions based on uh, different questions to the housing so questions on confidence in institutions comprise households confidence in governments politicians courts police hospitals etc questions on media exposure comprise how frequently household members watch tv listen to the radio read newspapers and questions on trust and conflict comprise how easily households trust each other households trust other households in the community or how easily a conflict may be resolved in the community so responses to each of these questions are highly correlated and therefore we have used the method of principal component analysis as the first step of this method we first generate the im values for each component for each of these broad questions that we have and after we have the im value we go with the general rule of uh, selecting the components that present an present an im value greater than 1 and after we have shortlisted the components we predict the component scores so that's the second step and in step 3 we create weighted indexes based on the im values and the predicted component scores and eventually we we have uh, our indexes on these three factors so empirical strategies in this slide i i'm presenting the well as uh, the baseline strategies strategies that we are using so in equation 1 we have female labor force participation on the left hand side this is being affected by law of household debt so beta 1 is our uh, coefficient of interest apart from that we have x which is a vector of household controls and p in here stands from primary sampling unit values equation 2 presents an average treatment effect framework where we are including the debt type so debt type could be informal debt or formal debt and sigma with a superscript of 2 in here gives us uh, the average treatment effect for household uh, that have an informal debt as compared to formal debt takers it is basically the differences between uh, informal debt takers and uh, formal debt takers the rest of the equation is similar to the is similar to equation one. so you can see the instrumental variable strategy uh, strategy in this uh, slide where in equation 3 which is the first stage of my iv strategy log of household debt is being de determined by epidemics so phi with a superscript of 3 gives us the effect on uh, gives uh, gives us the differences in the impact of epidemics as compared to the sample that did not experience epidemics and in stage 2 i'm controlling for uh, the first stage predicted residuals where female labor force participation is my outcome and log of household debt is my explanatory value so since i'm controlling for the first stage predicted residuals my iv strategy is basically a controlled function of each in all these equations size and individual household is h primary sampling unit is p and log of household debt is the natural log of uh, household debt plus 1 epidemic is binarily coded if a village had an epidemic in the last 7 years informal equals 1 for uh, loans taken from neighbors money lenders friends relatives private employers and it equals 0 for loans taken from banks credit institutions and government employers x is a vector of household controls and p is psu times So now I will move into the results. Table two shows the results for our baseline strategy, where in column one and two I do not present the complete model, whereas columns three and four comprise PSU fixed effects and all our controls. Effect of log of household debt is positive and statistically significant in column three, and in column four. the ate coefficient is statistically insignificant which tells us that uh, people taking an informal debt 
do not experience different female labor force participation as compared to those who take a formal death. So these are the results for the baseline strategy. This table shows the results for the IV strategy or the control function approach where in columns one and two, uh, I'm using epidemics in the village as the IV and in columns three and four, I'm using environmental shocks in the village as the IV. So uh, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to compare the effect uh, for uh, the sample that experienced epidemics and the sample that experienced environmental shocks. So in stage one, I find a huge and statistically significant impact of epidemics in the village, but uh, for environmental shock, the effect is small. And in stage two, where I'm controlling for the first stage predicted residuals, which is statistically significant, which implies that my uh, explanatory variable is endogenous in nature, so in stage two, the effect of log of household debt is positive. And for epidemics, it is higher than, than what we see in column three, what we see in our baseline uh, model. And uh, for environmental shock, the effect is slightly statistically significant, but uh, it's not, uh, you know, the magnitude is not high. Since we do not find a uh, statistically significant difference between formal and informal death takers. What I do here is I break down the sample for formal deaths and informal deaths. And for formal death, I find a smaller impact, but for informal death, the death is larger. And epidemics in the village, uh, the effect of epidemics in the village is statistically significant for informal death takers. And as a robustness check, I look at male labor force participation instead of female labor force participation. And in stage two for male labor force participation, I do not find any statistically significant impact, which actually strengthens our hypothesis that an increase in log of household debt is more uh, uh, credible to affect uh, female labor force participation than male labor force participation. So to conclude, we find that epidemic-driven deaths affect household decisions towards FNP. This finding contributes to the developing literature on COVID-19-induced borrowings in different countries. We also contribute to the literature on labor market participation in the post-pandemic period. And as compared to epidemics, we do not find a huge impact of environmental shocks on female labor force participation to household debt. And unlike um, female labor force participation, we also find that male employment is not statistically significantly affected due to, due to an increase in the epidemic driven deaths. And finally, the limitations of this work are plenty. Firstly, our IV uh, may potentially violate the ex exclusion restriction because our IV can be correlated with, uh, with unobserved factors that can affect female labor force participation. These unobserved factors, uh, unobserved factors other than uh, household debt, which may affect female labor force participation. And also our IV may not be completely exogenous or random because transmission of epidemics may be spatially dependent on epidemics occurring in one region. And thirdly, we have not examined what type of employment women are joining. Uh, whether it's a short-term employment or a long-term employment. For this, we'll have to adopt an M-Logic specification. And finally, uh, we, we plan to adopt a causal mediation analysis to examine the potential pathways other than household debt through which uh, female labor force participation can be affected by epidemics. So that is the end of my very short presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Abrodeep. That was really on time, and you actually saved us two minutes. So thank you very much for that. And that presentation was titled Household Day and Female Labor Force Participation in India. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, really interesting. If uh, anyone in the audience has any question, please type them up on the chat window, and we will get to them at the end of the presentation at the session, I mean, the panel and then uh, have a Q&A for that. 
Next up, we have Anisa Vatarai and Kiran Giri with another uh, very interesting topic. Toilet is mainland of institution, a study of toilets in Triwan University clock tower building in Kathmandu, Nepal. Anisa, your clock starts now. Um, thank you. Um, just a minute, let me share my screen. Um, can you see this? Yes, we can see it. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, the, uh, my friend Kiran Giri could not attend today, so I'll be uh, making the presentation on our behalf. Um, to begin with, uh, generally the state of sanitation, as per the Sanitation and Hygiene Master Plan of Nepal, um, states that uh, it could be achieved in two phases, that is, achievement of open defecation free situation and sustainability of uh, sanitation and sanitized behavior, which we believe that uh, toilet plays an important part in making sure that we achieve both of them. Since we could um, neither uh, see defecation outside if there is a presence of and use of toilets, and also that the continuation of the practice could um, help in sustaining the sanitation behavior. Um, in terms of uh, institutional sanitation, the, the master plan also states that the toilets should be user-friendly, hygienic, clean with uh, hand washing stations and soap station and proper waste management facilities. Schools should have child, gender and visibility friendly um, toilets, water conditions and hand washing facilities along with other facilities for maintaining menstrual hygiene. Um, garbage pits facilities within the school area and the premises of all institutions to be clean and hygienic. So this also applies to the university building and the, uh, um, for those who do not know, Triwan University is one of the oldest and uh, the um, first uh, public university in Nepal and it is in the capital city Kathmandu and uh, most of the departments, uh, most of the disciplinary departments are still at the university campus. So it is one of the very um, place where possible um, academicians, policymakers, implementation officers, and all of these um, human resources are produced. Um, so um, what we are trying to do here is rather than seeing toilets as just a physical space for um, um, uh, um, controlling open defecation situation. It is also a social um, space where we can observe the um, cultural and also um, other values such as gender relations, um, governance systems and such of an institution. And in doing so, um, we have derived the principle of uh, mainland, uh, mainland and island, which uh, was used by Van der Gest and Fink Finkler in their work in hospital ethnography for medical anthropology where they state that the hospitals are island of a culture where they are um, residing because uh, through observation of hospitals you could um, see the power relations status relations and social cultural values of the culture um, and it is not just a place where uh, patients are being treated so similar idea has been derived here where we argue that toilets are not just a place where you go uh, to relieve yourself of bodily rest, but also a place where you can see much more than just um, the, the materialistic or physical aspect of it. Anissa, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you hit next on your slide, please? Sorry? Uh, can you uh, advance your slide next? Yeah, sure. Um, so for this, um, the participant observation happened from 2014 and 16, and it was not intentional at the beginning because um, we joined the university as students on Masters of Anthropology during 2014, and we were there until 16. And we, uh, when we thought of uh, doing this research, we decided that we could also reflect on our own experience and um, um, kind of uh, uh, use that for generating data. So we also, um, had interviews with the administrative staffs, professors, um, the then principal, the water supply staff, cleaner, and students who were using the toilets frequently. Um, so 
generally in context of Nepal, what uh, we see is um, toilets are considered as island. Uh, in a sense, as traditionally, the uh, older Nepali build buildings or houses did not used to have toilets inside the structure, inside the main structure, and they were either at a corner or a, at a little distance. So in that sense, we could say that toilets could have been um, an ice island or an isolated unit. Sorry so, um, to interrupt, but yeah. I can't see any of your slides. I'm so excited about your presentation, but I can't see any slides. Um, I'm not only, sure the, the, only the first page is stuck here. Okay, I'll yeah. try stopping it and resharing it. No, 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 you, we can still see. Go to your next slide, Anissa. Go hit no, next. I have been doing that. It's okay, play it again, do that. Oh, it's not moving. Yeah, I have been doing that. I'm not sure what is going on. We can only see your, yeah. Oh. The first one? Yeah, we can only see your first slide, yeah. Now, can you uh -huh. see? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay, yeah, now we can see. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if this stops when I do the slideshow. Do it that, yeah. Okay. So can you still see this? Yes, I can. It's awesome. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, the, the toilet as a physical space uh, represents the materialistic aspects such as awareness practices and the practices, sanitation practices of the institution. Um, clean toilets represents responsible management, which uh, we would like to call good governance and vice versa. Um, the materialistic characters, as Moloch had pointed out, um, could affect mental health of the users, especially when they go the entire day without elimination to avoid danger, embarrassment, or dirt. And this we had also found in our own research where the student stated that they did not want to use the toilet so much that they would either fold um, going to the uh, to toilets. And um, we had actually three hour classes. So uh, we had to either hold it for three hours or you know be brave enough to enter the toilet despite the, um, the unfortunate um, scenes in front of us and then the odor. Or we have to risk uh, uh, leaving 10 minutes of our classroom uh, discussions. So that uh, because of that, most of the students avoided drinking water so that you know they could um, control their pee, or uh, they do not have to uh, uh, use the toilet. So that could result in other health benefits. Sorry, <laughs> health risks, which uh, I have mentioned in the slide. So I would not be going over. Um, so this was the condition of the toilets. Um, can you see the? Photos? No, we're not. Uh, you're not moving again. Hit next. Oh. I, I'm i doing that. I'm not sure why this is. Yes, yeah, Anisha, so... I think if you stop this slide, sh um, slide show and then just do the small one, then we're able to see it. Okay, we can do that. So now? Mm -hmm. Yes, thankfully. Yes. Yeah, so um, the, the one, the third picture, this is not the uh, one that we would be using. These were the ones that uh, were not in use. Um, and uh, out of um, six or seven stalls, two or three of them would be in this condition. So these were out of question when they, you, uh, we were supposed to use. So as you can see this, this uh, second picture is the urinal area of the uh, boys' toilet. And um, if you can see the cursor, there's a door that you can see. and. Through this door, um, girls used to pass to use the stalls. And I'd be coming to that later. And like you can see in the first picture, there are wash patients, but there's no tap. And the drum at the uh, right-hand corner is the one where it is used, uh, it is supposed to be used to um, store water, but unfortunately, it only collects spider webs. So um, that was the condition of the toilets when we were studying there. And uh, um, fortunately, it is not the condition anymore. It has been much cleaner. And compared to the past, now 
um, it has been um, cleaned every 15 to 20 days from what I have heard. But uh, since we could not visit it uh, now, we are only, oh, yes, no, I don't know. so, yeah. We, we lost it, okay, it's back. Yeah. yeah, but I don't think I can use the slides so here. Yeah. Hmm. Just a minute. So I do not have the recent picture since I had not been able to go to go to the university uh, since the pandemic hit. Um, and most of my pre our presentation would be based on the data that we had collected back then. So. Um, so uh, I'm still arguing that the toilets were not in good condition. Um, so toilet adds social space. Um, as Moloch and Noren had pointed out, toilet becomes a tool for figuring out just how society functions, what it values, how it separates people from one another, and the kind of trade-offs that come to be made. Um, in this regard, what we could uh, see was there were separate toilets for men and women, and separate uh, toilets for professors, lecturers, or the faculty members, staffs, and the students. So in that sense, we could say that a toilet also represent the um, social that status that the uh, users um, at the university held. So um, also the, uh, the dirtiness of feces, which um, could be, um, you know, like the pieces are considered dirty when, only when they are out in open, when we can see it. If they are inside the sewers or inside the toilets, then these are not considered as dirt because they are, they are uh, supposed to be, uh, they are right where they are supposed to be. So in that sense, the toilet could also be social. That, that's kind of social aspect of toilets. So um, another thing that we observed through um, the study of toilet was the gender difference differences that the university practiced because um, as Nolan and Norek had um, stated in their own research, we also found that the uh, toilets at the university where uh, there were more toilets for men compared to women and the building that we had studied, um, it had um, uh, two sites where boys toilet uh, was present at both of the corner of the uh, end of the building while girls toilet was only at one end and the urinal, urinal sorry urinal that i showed you earlier was uh, found in boys toilet and no such thing was there in girls toilet so girls had to wait longer period of time if uh, you know like during the break all of us had to go there because there were just six rows and in one class there would be at least 12 girls so we had to wait online uh, even for peeing while the boys could you know like relieve themselves all at once um yeah and also uh during our study the uh, we used to go share the toilet with the boys and one of the reason for that was the other the toilet supposed to be uh, for girls was on the other end and traveling there would require five minutes of our time going there and then coming back so to save that time, we use the same bathroom as the boys. And um, in doing so, we had to pass through the urinals. And it would be an embarrassing moment for both of us. So we would turn on the other side. So urinals were on our left and we would turn right like this. And then we, pass, we would pass through that. So another thing that as a woman, we uh, suffered was during our menstrual cycle because um, we did not have pads or pad stations there. And even if we carried one, it would be very difficult for us to change it inside the uh, toilets because one, there would be no water. Second, there would be no place, uh, there was no place uh, for throwing it. There were no dustbins. So that would make it, make it very difficult for us to uh, use the toilets during menstrual periods. And also for boys, I think if you have uh, some you know, like disturbance in your stomach or certain situations like that, 
then you'd better not come to the university because you'd not have the basic facilities such as water or soap that you'd be requiring to maintain hygiene after the use of toilet. So that was one of the, um, the um, problems that we saw that the institution did not regard the need of women. They were kind of insensitive towards the need of female students compared to men. And also there was no space for gender minorities, probably because the university didn't neither have students nor teacher from any other gender recognized as male and female. So um, there were no toilets. And also- um, I'm sorry, uh, your time is uh, unfortunately- about, Okay, yeah. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to wrap it up. Uh, okay. So, uh, so yeah, to, um, okay, sorry. So, um, in terms of governance also, there would be no surveillance. And um, I won't be going into detail since I do not have much time. But um, the, the way that the university is not friendly for um, uh, people with disability um, uh, towards the female students, um, it was visible to the through the toilets also because it was neither gender friendly nor disability friendly and the entire building was not disability friendly because you could not uh, use a wheelchair to get into the first floor of the building climbing all those uh, 20 or plus stairs so um, in terms of uh, taking responsibility also we were also in kind of intrigued by the fact that the students did not consider it as their own responsibility to keep the toilets clean while they were one of the uh, major agents in using it regularly and we thought maybe it was a form of resistance because if you are giving us giving us something that we can't use then why not return it back in wor even worse condition than what you had given me so that's how we think might be a reason how the student resisted um, but it's kind of uh, more like irresponsibility in the sense of uh, cleaning staffs students and teachers as well. And it's kind of uh, reflects the entire uh, way how the university functions at other levels also, given it um, the, um, the delays in exams or results or any other thing. So in that sense, uh, what we are trying, we were trying to do, and it needs more work, this is still a work in prog progress. So what um, we are trying to do is see how we, through the study of toilets, we could uh, study the uh, the sociocultural values of through an university or any in, um, institution as for that matter. Thank Outstanding. You. Thank you so very much, Anishadi. I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to stop with here. Uh, we'll come back to the uh, the other points that you're trying to uh, make on, at the end of the hour. So yes. let's move on. Thank you. I'm sorry. I apologize for the technical issues here. I thought we learned this thing over the last two years too. Still haven't done that. Um, Sorry about that. Thank you. Let's move on to the next presentation by uh, Anjan Chakraborty, Rimu Choudhury, Arindam Chatterjee, uh, with the title Defending Polyandry an Exploratory Note from La Chung Valley of Sikkim in, in India. I'm sorry, I apologize if I didn't say the name of the village uh, correctly. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, La Chung Valley. Thank you. Uh, good morning to US and good evening to rest of the world. And uh, the we will be presenting me, Anjun and Orindam. We will be presenting the paper. And thank you for giving us the opportunity. And uh, our main focus, the name is uh, self-explanatory. Why does polyandry sustain against the dominance of monogamy? an exploratory model with special reference to Lachung Valley of Eastern Himalaya state of Sikkim. Actually, our main focus uh, is to see that the to explore the possible explanations for rejecting polyandry system of marriage and the acceptance of monogamy as a legitimate system by dominant development discourse. This is our first point. And secondly, we want to you know, that in, we want to see that in spite of global acceptance of monogamy marriage, why does polyandry marriage system exist in remote high altitude areas and will it be sustaining? This is our second po key point. And the third key point is, does Green Paper of South Africa on acceptance of polyandry system 
bring change in the development discourse because we have seen that recently during pandemic the in south africa polyandry has come into green paper so this is our the third point and the third question and uh, here based on the secondary data few secondary data and on the basis of few assumptions such as the low fertility unskilled society adverse sex ratio low level of income apc that means average propensity to consume and mpc marginal propensity to consume as constant consumption is highly in income inelastic a mathematical formulation is made to explore dynamics of the society of lachung valley of north sikkim of india and uh, this structure is also remotely visible in himachal pradesh nilgiri of tamil nadu tibet in those areas and uh, now i will uh, i'd love to request anjun to take it forward because he is the first author so anjun please you please uh, share your slide and you please take it forward anjun please i think i i hope the slides are visible isn't it Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, it's a uh, good evening from India and good morning to America. Uh, so already uh, Rimu has given the background of the strategy. Now to move forward, uh, just to let let us consider that uh, uh, when the most of the societies were, uh, especially uh, they are um, in a feudalistic system and polygamy or polygyny was was, was, was absolutely prevalent. Uh, so be it east or be it west. Now, if you look from the western point of view, uh, then we will follow that uh, the, there are a few triggers that actually uh, allow um, the western uh, world to adopt the monogamy marriage system. And those triggers have been something like this: the, the, the first and foremost is the industrial revolution since the west, uh, which actually created the factory system, um, and uh, the workers uh, they, uh, they 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 move from one place to other. Uh, to settle and to work in the factories this is the first point number one point number two as i mentioned that the transition from feudalism to capitalist para capitalistic system so uh, the joint family that disintegrated uh, then urbanization took place small family emerged and as a, as well as the most of the people they got acquainted with uh, with either factory works or a later on the services and at the same time that private property rights and well defined inheritance laws were, were, were have been in place so these are the four possible reasons possibly allowed or helped uh, or to give a trigger uh, to move from polygamy to monogamy and the important reason that we can find out at that the human capital approach that the modern economics has taken uh, possibly that worked as a precursor now this human capital model that no longer i have the liberty or can i have um, for the wish i have having a strong wish to having multiple wives uh, having uh, two skills only to, to to be a child and do the household works and multiple wives and the, even even the kids also they would be a kind of if they remain unskilled that hardly matters so from from there being a part of industry and services i realized the skill uh, uh, progeny is an important issue and therefore i will negotiate for a skilled woman or the skilled wife so that actually trigger or pushed up the demand for the a skilled wife so the marriage market if we look then we'll realize that that there's the marriage in the marriage market the demand for skilled wife uh, has uh, has shot up and as a result of that and the reason behind that is the cost of rearing children will be lower so my next generation will get a skill having a uh, limited expenses so based on that actually the human capital model that has been, uh, maybe that the most of our gary baker they formulated so therefore that's the way we negotiated and the moving to the next slide so this is precisely uh, the summary of that that uh, how that income if it is a function of human capital then high demand for quality child high demand for quality and skilled women in the marriage market that will raise the price of quality of women in business price not in the uh, in the in the monetary terms but the in the demand caps 
and then reach many in economically advanced countries settled for the monogamy. Precisely, this is the transition that took place. However, the countries which are not industrialized or the way we uh, perceive the development or the development dominant development discourse, uh, where the feudal system as well as the capitalist system get intertwined, there we find the different variations or in different layers, the monogamy uh, and polygamy, uh, both are coexisting, maybe uh, illegally or illegally. And if you look at the advanced countries, if the scale of the women, it uh, increases or it keeps on moving up and it surpasses the male, then the natural corollary would be the divorce or the living system that we, are, that we are observing in the developed countries, as well as certain segment in the other developed countries too. Now, this is the background of from polygamy to monogamy, but what's about uh, the uh, uh, about polyandry, which has never been considered as a, a legal marriage system, or it hasn't have a legal sanction, and all the modern development discourse as a marriage as an institution accepted it, they have rejected it. And while it is prevalent, prevalent already it is mentioned uh, by Rimbu, that it is prevalent in, uh, in Shikim, it is prevalent in some part of Uttarakhand, it is prevalent in some part of Paharia region of Nepal, in Tibet, and so in some Brazilian communities, and so on and so forth. Now, this is our study area, focus area, not study area, because it is an exploratory study. So, few basic facts the area as per the population is very minuscule, it is 2495, and uh, sex ratio uh, it has mentioned in the below, it is 289. Now, with this, if we move to the next side, what is the possible reasons if we take Sikkim? The Lachu Valley, which is in a high altitude in Eastern Himalaya, the people are pastoral in nature. Pastoral, pastoralism is a basic their livelihood pattern, and they uh, in in a dispersed settlement in a, with a very slow resource base. They are sustaining over time, and they are practicing it. Now, what are what might be the possible causes of having a polyandry marriage system uh, prevalent? in those high altitude people, most belong to the uh, Tibetan communities or tribes. So if we look that absolute resource scarcity or finite resource base, very low sex ratio, very small land holding because in high altitude though, the percentage of land might be quite high, forest cover might be high, but individual land holding or the private property per se is a very minuscule and concept of private property is also, uh, it's not a very well defined in this, the, among these communities, which we fail to recognize. So there is a limited alternative production of, uh, uh, opportunities that they cannot move out uh, from pastoralism because alternative livelihood uh, practices are not available and it is a self-sufficient scattered settlement and incapacity to sustain high population prompted them to adapt social custom such as polyandry or and monastic life. So the modern development discourse didn't consider these issues and didn't incorporate or accept it, this polyandry marriage system. But what we observe that these are the basic precursor for prevailing prevalence of the polyandry marriage system. Now, our take on the whole issue or the question that we would like to raise that if we keep on changing the variables based on which the mathematical formulation has been done. So I'll just do a little bit of data crunching. This, uh, this will be very important data that we have say, for example, that we make all the male and female skilled, number one. Number two, we male, made all the people, the income level has been raised, the consumption expenditure has been raised. Uh, so will that break the uh, break this particular polyandry porous system in our mathematical formation that organism is going to take up, we realize that if we keep on changing all other variables, that we make all uh, male and female skilled, or maybe we take a blend of skilled and unskilled women, and we take the income level has been raised, consumption expenditure has been raised. As a consequence, the APC, average propensity to consume, marginal propensity to consume, change, income level change, everything change. Even the skill set has been given, but we find that the one of the important variables is the sex ratio, which is adverse, absolutely adverse. We find in 2001, it is 406, and in 2011, it is 389. So given this, this 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 particular sex ratio, the number of female, that irrespective of changes in other parameters, if the sex ratio persists, 
then this parliamentary marriage system will sustain. Why? Because if I move out from this particular marriage system, being a polyandry family, then I, first of all, the subdivisions of the uh, resource will, will, will be very minuscule, number one, hardly anything would be left. And second is that until unless the dominant dis development discourse, the economy that has been created, I am not getting, becoming part of that. I am not going to move out from this particular system. So this likely to sustain. And therefore, the dominant development discourse, which have accepted the live-in relationship, which has accepted the uh, uh, divorce, and which is accepted the even extramarital relationship, but they are intrinsically gender biased because the property inheritance is in a male line, but they are not considering these basic parameters or basic variables which actually allowing this kind of society to be part with the polyandry marriage system. So now may I request uh, or them to uh, carry on the mathematical formation formulations of the matter. Uh, thanks, Anjan. Um, I'll take over from here. Uh, good morning and good evening, uh, as the cases may be. Anjan, can you please stop sharing the screen so that I can share my screen? OK, that's uh, I want the I want the slides to be presented. Yeah. Uh, Arindan, before you start, you have roughly three minutes. Okay, fine. Thank you. I won't take too much time. Okay. Can you stop sharing, Anjan? I'll be sharing my screen then. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let me start. Uh, then I'll be sharing my screen. So uh, the mathematical formulation is based on a few lemma and propositions uh, based on the assumptions which uh, Rimu, Madam, and uh, Anjan has already mentioned. Uh, basically, uh, we have a very adverse sex ratio and, uh, uh, and uh, the fertility rate is very less and the pastoral economy, uh, which is uh, not very conducive for higher income. Uh, so in that case, um, uh, in in such a uh, with such conditions, uh, uh, <clears throat> with such conditions, if the income of a man, so this is a lemma we have said, if the income of a man is twice the consumption expenditure he incurs, then he may have at least one wife or more. Now this is a very unlikely possibility in such a uh, high altitude place where the economy is really not good. So pastoral people survive on a very low level of subsistence income, so which is having a narrow consumption basket. So this implies that polyandry will sustain. <clears throat> now we, can, we consider two extreme situations uh, which are proven in mathematical uh, formulations that there are only unskilled men and unskilled women exist in the society. Second, both skilled and unskilled men exist and there are women uh, skilled and unskilled, but skilled women only marry uh, skilled uh, skilled men. And in that case, what will happen? In both cases, we'll show that sex ratio continues to be much less than one. I'm sorry, we assume that this will be much less than one. <clears throat> okay, so in that case, the first proposition is that in a polyandry system, the unskilled man who is having no intention to have a skilled wife and children will continue to have a wife less than one in number if the prevalent sex ratio continues to remain much less than unity. In other words, polyandry will sustain. We'll, uh, we have already uh, 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 written a paper and we have proven all these mathematical formulations so that um, basically uh, uh, this is an extreme condition where if the sex ratio uh, is very less, then polyandry will sustain. Okay with such a condition. In proposition two, if both skilled and unskilled male exist and women are all skilled uh, or it can be unskilled, then in that case also, we can show her two lemma that polyandry will sustain. The first situation is the unlikely situation. If female ratio is less than both skilled and unskilled men. Okay, in that case, uh, before all skilled men are getting skilled wives, skilled female should be exhausted. And part of skilled men and unskilled all unskilled men will not get, he, get any wife. This is the first lemma, which is an unlikely situation. The more likely situation is that the fraction is 
uh, more than one of the ratios, like uh, maybe unskilled married men or skilled married men. In such a case, if the number of wives per unskilled man is very less, like 0.2, in that case, for every unskilled person, if there is less than or equal to 0.8 skilled people, then only every skilled person will not be involved in a polyandrous uh, relationship. So that means it is a very, it is a very uh, uh, unlikely situation where we have uh, a very high requirement of uh, a ratio of 0.8. So this is only possible for the unlikely case that the number of wives married to an unskilled man is very less which may be uh, an unrealistic situation. The situation two is the most realistic situation is where the number is much higher, say 0.4. In that case, there has to be a relationship between skilled and unskilled person, which is should be less than or equal to zero C. Again, this is not a very general case. So let us look at the more likely uh, uh, general case. So in that case, we haven't really formulated the... I mean, I'm really sorry to interrupt here, but you really have to uh, wrap it up, please. You've yes. used your time, yeah. Okay, just this figure, I am not going into the formulation of words here. So what mm -hmm. I'm saying here is that, as you can see, the horizontal axis is one by the number of wives of an unskilled man marries. As you can see, it is varying from one to 10. So that means the ratio is from one to point, point 0.1. So that is a huge variation. And in that variation, you can see the vertical axis is basically the ratio of unskilled to skilled men to sustain polyandry. And you can see it is bonded. Uh, the relationship between uh, the number of husbands a wife can have uh, is actually greater than this value. So that means if you have a bond like this, you can always, uh, always have a value for the number of males which, is, uh, which a female marries uh, since it is a bonded value, so it can be always greater than that. Uh, that means every uh, a, a woman is more likely to have a polyandrous relationship. This is for the case of uh, when unskilled men are more than skilled men. If you just change the uh, parameters, like skilled men are more than unskilled men, the same uh, equation holds. If you are interested, you can look at the uh, calculations we have uh, in our in our work. So the whole thing is done in some algebraic equations, simultaneous equations, and in equations. Thank That's you. it from me. Thank Thanks, Rukash. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so sorry for being rude. No, but we want to give at least eight or 12 minutes to the next presenter, please. Okay. Let's move on to the final presenter, uh, Anup Shekhar uh, Chakravarti, sexually ambivalent Gorkha and pink migration from Northeast India. Uh, please. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, I yeah. know that we are running out of time. So what I'll do is instead of reading out my thick paper, which is about 20 pages, and it's footnoted heavily, and I quote from various places. Uh, so let me try and uh, you know sum up what I have in my paper. Uh, the title of my paper has already been said, so I'm not repeating it. Uh, it's divided into six segments. In the first segment, which is titled Complicating Contemporary Barracks Post Decriminalization of section 377 of the IPC in India. Uh, the second segment is on methods and concepts. Then I have a third segment where I'm looking at uh, how or what it is uh, all about being Gorkha in the Northeast of India. Then there is a segment, which is the fourth segment, which deals with uh, finding pink sky. Uh, the fifth segment is uh, how uh, we look at that pink sky, that is our sky, the dreams, hopes, and the exasperations that ambivalent persons uh, experience. Uh, then we have a sixth segment, which is the Indrajal, uh, the web in real and virtual. So basically, I'm looking at uh, different dimensions of how sexualities and identities are negotiated. In the first segment, I'm looking at why it becomes so essential to deal with uh, ambivalence or you know uh, sexuality which is not so clear uh, because it's not essential especially in south asia what i have seen through my studies is that it's not always uh, possible to apply western terms or labels whether it is uh, terms that we use in uh, sexualities when we refer to specifically to male persons, uh, whether it is a top bottom hierarchy, whether it is a you know passive or active partner, etc. All those things are not 
uh, very, you know, most of the respondents that I have had have not been comfortable with those labels or terminologies that they use. Uh, in fact, uh, they are, uh, there are a lot of resistance and uh, there is a desire to come up with new labels and terminologies when we are dealing with sexual identities. So in, uh, you know, we have had very recently uh, a decriminalization of homosexuality in India. And uh, there is also a lot of uh, fan, you know, a, a lot of uh, halagulla that we are having uh, in terms of legalizing same-sex marriage, et cetera. But then, you know, uh, what we are looking at is whether we are really comfortable looking and dealing with it in our social realities. So especially when it comes to the Gorkhas, the main idea uh, or the inheritance of an idea for the Gorkha community is that they are a very brave community and that they are mercenaries, they're working as sipais, they are in the army, etc. So there are uh, the whole idea or the construction of shared heritages between India and Nepal uh, in terms of the Gorkha identity is that it's an identity which is muscular, it's an identity which is military, and it's very, very, uh, it's oozing with militarized masculinities, how we would call it. Now, what becomes really interesting is, uh, is it always applicable uh, to all men that they are always very militarized? All Gorkha men or the Nepali speaking men, are they always militarized in their upbringing? What about those who do not fall or who do not fit into that label of, uh, you know, uh, the militarized, masculinized Gorkha brave person? What about those, uh, those Gorkha Nepali speaking population of men in particular who do not fit into that bill? And that ambivalence is what I'm trying to uh, look at. Uh, many of the respondents, I conducted an interview of more than uh, 60 persons, male persons. And uh, this has been a very long study from 2011 to 2021. And during the pandemic, you know, uh, what I had to do was I had to go in for uh, a virtual ethnography also, switching and changing the methods in which I was studying this particular group and complicating the issues therein. So here we see that in the Northeast, uh, the Northeast itself is, you know, it comprises eight different states in India. And each of them have a different history. Each of them have a different kind of patriarchal settings. Uh, one of them has a matrilineal kind of setting as well, but for a very small section of them. But what we do see is the presence of the Nepali speaking population or the Gorkha population in Northeast. And the Gorkha population in Northeast suffers from two uh, overarching problems. One is the overarching patriarchal issues of uh, being a very muscular tribal ethnic identity within the ground level and at the, uh, you know, over within the community, they have the overarching problem of showing a very muscular kind of Gorkha identity. So you must be understanding how difficult it would be for those Gorkha men who do not fall into the fit of being brave men. So uh, what happens is that they move out of their uh, specific rural settings in the Northeast, whether it is from Manipur, from Mizoram, from Arunachal, from Assam, or from Tripura or elsewhere, they move out to spaces which are more comfortable where they can have a choice of their sexualities or where they can at least camouflage and keep conceal their identities to a large extent. And this is what we refer to as uh, the pink migration where you move out of a particular place because you feel that your sexuality is at risk or that you are being threatened by your sexuality. So when they come to these metropolitan centers, whether it is Calcutta, whether it is Bangalore, whether it is Mumbai or Delhi, or you know, even go abroad, what happens is that they are in a quest for finding a pink sky or a gulabi asma where they might be more comfortable concealing or playing with their identities. We all play with our identities. It's never fixed and final. That is what at least I have understood from the respondents which gave answers to various questions. Uh, so while moving out of these, you know, pink migrations from uh, their rural setting, the Northeast, to uh, the metropolitan centers where they feel it is safer and much more uh, nicer to be, uh, you know, operating uh, or uh, conducting their sexualities, what happens is that they go into rural indebtedness because from the stage of takeoff to the flight, we have, you know, uh, at least the respondents gave me an answer that they took loans, they sold their old homes, they uh, left back uh, behind their uh, family property, etc. Uh, they, uh, uh, you know, they uh, 
felt that they left their property, joint property in most of them, because it was held by a family. It was not individually owned, etc. So they left it and they went out to seek uh, employment. And in many cases, they would snip their chances of coming back because they, were, they would close their ties. Uh, so it would be a kind of, uh, you know, new avatar of a person moving out from northeast to elsewhere. So there was a strong uh, rural indebtedness also because they took loans uh, uh, from money lenders and from uh, private houses. Sometimes they their flight from, let's say, a remote place in Manipur uh, came up to uh, the uh, stage where they came to centers in the northeast, such as Guwahati or Shillong, where they walked for uh, you know, a temporary time being. So in that sense also, there were cases where they were sexually exploited by male persons, et cetera. So whatever it was, in this flight from uh, one particular geographical uh, spatial domain to the other metropolitan domain, what happened was uh, you have uh, exploitation of men, which is being conducted by men who uh, are the kitten kin or people whom they trust, et cetera. So the, whole idea of an emotional bond or an emotional space in the metropole was also being questioned. Uh, then in the segment where I have, you know, it also shows these exasperations. Then in the segment, which I have the sixth segment, which I'm coming very quickly because we don't have much time, to, uh, which I refer to as the Indrajal, uh, the web in real and virtual. Here we see that those men who come from the Northeast, especially the Gorkha men, try to negotiate themselves and try to connect through emotional bondings in uh, using various platforms or app-based uh, gadgets, based app-based computerized kind of life worlds, be it through uh, Grindr, be it through uh, Blued, or any other uh, app-based dating app, you know, trying to come into connection, et cetera. So in this, particular space, uh, when I did this, you know, ethnographic, virtual ethnography in this case, the respondents gave me an answer. The, uh, the respondents gave me an answer that they do it for finding uh, a queer emotional space and also the idea of finding love on the internet or through connecting through this world uh, of, uh, you know, uh, virtuality what we refer to as e-love in uh, the context of, uh, you know, uh, contemporary love situations. So what is really interesting is that there is also a age difference in the use of these virtual spaces. And uh, these ambivalent persons or Gorkha persons who move out from the Northeast to elsewhere are actually trying to reconfigure themselves and their sexualities in the cities by looking at cities as a gender space. So these are the various ideas that are there in my paper for the discussant who must have read it would understand the various thickly, you know, uh, uh, very condensed as well as uh, very difficult kind of uh, ideas that I'm trying to combine together while dealing with uh, sexual ambivalence and uh, pink migration and how they go into cities and other places to secure their ideas. So uh, what we see is that uh, there is a sexual ambivalence because uh, in the context of South Asia, all men are not comfortable uh, with the use of certain labels that NGOs and international funding organizations have been using, such as the term uh, MSM, where they say men having sex with men. The uh, interviews that I conducted persons told me that they were more comfortable with using uh, a, a term or an acronym which is more suited for South Asia. And they referred the term as MIM, that is men interested in men, because it was not just about sex, it was about emotional bonding and much more. Uh, so in that sense, uh, this paper attempts to weave an ethnographic narrative of uh, you know, uh, Nepali speaking persons in various situations or services, whether it is militarized services or whether it is services such as banking, teaching, fashion, uh, so many, you know, uh, so how they uh, do the bonding between themselves, because we have heard and spoken a lot about female bonding, but uh, you know, we hardly talk about male bonding. And, uh, you know, it's a variety of male bonding that takes places. Uh, especially if we look at the segment where I'm dealing with uh, the cantonments that we see. In the cantonments also, there is a variety of bonding that happens from bromance to jodidar to londebazi, etc. Et 
So uh, this is what I, my paper is all about, and I sum it up. I hope I was able to share at least bits and parts of what I have in my tech paper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Anupji. Before this thing closes up, I do want to apologize. Uh, we've been unfair to you. We took up too much no, time, so I didn't do a good job in terms of moderating, so blame me. Uh, as we go in for volume or something, it can always be published later. Yeah, I think uh, each one of these papers, if you look at them, my goodness, these are otherwise overlooked, grossly overlooked, I would say, in terms of research. So thank you all so very much. I hope we can continue the conversation in some form. There are some good uh, um, comments, uh, recommendations, or um, stuff on the chat window. Um, let's continue the conversation thank you all so very much i'll see you in the next panel thanks